a lot of little things that, well, that trip up businesses and take up a lot of time, you can actually automate it or get close to it or build processes around it. Hey, my name is Felix Tia. I'm the host of Shopify Masters, a weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn what this entrepreneur means when he says that the process removes motivation from the equation, why you should not start with Facebook ads, and where you should start first, and what you should test tweaking first in your Facebook ads. Today, I'm joined by Remy from Blank Tag Co. Blank Tag Co. sells high-quality stickers to help people express themselves. It was started in 2017 and based off Los Angeles and is a multiple six-figure business. Welcome, Remy. Hey, how's it going, man? Good, man. So this all this idea behind this business, everything all started with a trip to Japan. Tell us about what happened there. Yeah, so uh, my girlfriend and I, girlfriend Alondra, she, uh, she lives in LA and I was living in Maryland. So we were long distance for a while. I was actually originally in LA and I moved back to Maryland. And so in order for ways to like us to meet up, we just met up in different cities all over the country. So like Seattle or Portland or like Austin, things like that. But then one year, uh, actually in October, we decided, hey, let's go to Korea. And then at the, at, you know, while we decided to go to Korea, she also said, hey, let's go to Japan as well. So uh, and I think it was like early October, we flew to Japan. And then we were just walking around and we noticed this like big store called Tokyo Hands. And we walked in, it was like a, a huge like uh, arts and craft store. And then we saw this one like, stand and it was nothing but stickers, but it was like just so unique. It was like the goofiest stickers. It was um, like a coffee cup, it just random objects. And there's this guy like naked, but with just socks on and like weird poses. And because they were so goofy and interesting, I just, I just had to grab one. And bought one and then thought of nothing after that and then eventually uh Londra and i were just walking around in I believe uh harajuku and we were walking and we noticed the same store that ma- manufactured the stickers they're called b-side label and first i was shocked that there's a store that only sells or heavily just sells stickers and they're on a really popular street in japan so i'm just shocked they're selling so many stickers to sustain that store so we walked in and i was just amazed by how many stickers they had uh, but the only problem I noticed was like, it was all just like purely Japanese culture based and all the wording was in Japanese. So it was super interesting to look at as a tourist. And I'm sure if you're Japanese, it looks, makes way more sense. Um, but the, you know, I just kept thinking about it, that there's nothing really like it in the U S. And so I talked to Alondra about it and she wasn't a big fan of the idea, but I just like to do things either way. So I started the business and that's like the super beginning of what happened. So we basically saw stickers, got super interested, and just wanted to try it. Yes, I think a lot of people will see something like this when they go on vacation or they'll see something that catches their eye, but they're not going to immediately think, oh, maybe there is a business opportunity behind this. So have you started business before? Like, How are you perceptive to, I guess, business ideas as you are traveling and seeing stores? Yeah, so you know, at the same time, I was, I was actually, I had this website called Sunday Meal Pepper. And it's this website where you go to the website, you purchase, um, a, it's like a subscription where you get weekly emails of food recipes for meal prep. And one was, and it was basically two versions of it. One is like weight loss and one is weight gain. And that process is automated and I really enjoyed it, but I, I felt like I hit a wall. I couldn't grow anymore. I wasn't running paid ads behind it, but I knew I wanted to do some kind of business outside of this. And this one wasn't going to sustain over time. So I kept look. I kept thinking of ideas, but not specifically during that trip. I just happened to see the sticker business, and I was just super excited that I wanted to try it. So I had a good understanding of like what to do to start a business. So like LLCs, uh, building a website, and automating a lot of functions. Yeah, I think um, when people have a business already or something that that's going already, they can either choose to kind of go deeper down that same category, down that same route, or do something completely different. And you obviously, this is stickers versus like uh, recipes; it's totally different. Uh, what, what made you um, decide to? I guess what made you comfortable, or what made you desire to step outside what you are already doing? Uh, the honest question: is I was kind of bored. I wanted to do something that was super exciting for me. So I'm not a like I, I've always liked stickers, but I wasn't absolutely obsessed with them until I saw these these B side label ones. I'm just I was so excited by how interesting these are. 
And the other piece is like, Alondra and I, we're both super deep into our culture. So Alondra, my girlfriend and business partner, she's 100% Salvadoran. I'm Korean and Mexican. And we we we, don't like our, we love our culture. We want to showcase it, but we just didn't know like the best way how. And we thought this process through stickers, it makes a lot of sense because stickers are like a way to express who you are and kind of introduce yourself to the world of what you're interested in and your culture as well. For example, if you put a sticker on your laptop, you're not going to put one that makes absolutely no sense and doesn't relate to you at all. You want it to be something to relate to you. And so that's why it made perfect sense for us. So the stickers are super interesting as a product, but also it ties to our cultures as well. And we, you know, U.S. is like a, a huge melting pot and everyone has super diverse backgrounds and cultures. And we also want to help people express that as well. Makes sense. So what did you learn from your past business that fast track your success in, in blank tag? A few things I'd say is one, it's automating functions. So a lot of little things that, well, that triple businesses and take up a lot of time, you can actually automate it or get close to it or build processes around it. Uh, for example, um, let's see. well, what I do now here, Shopify I, I love the product, but there's one thing that I, I think needs to be tweaked in, is in the email where it's um, when customers want to switch their product, like switch their order. I constantly get emails saying, hey, I want to switch my order, change my product or like, increase the volume or something. You put a little thing in the email explaining how to exactly do it in their confirmation email. Since I did that, it basically cut down my time to zero for editing orders. So it's looking at all the things. I basically track all, all the things I do for my business and how much time it takes, and then see how I can automate it or build processes around it that the customers can actually do it themselves. Got it. Yeah, this is definitely a optimization that can save you a lot of time, money, and headache. So when you are looking at your business, what is something that you try to look for, look to automate right away? Like any business for the most part, what is an area that you like to focus on that can kind of give you the biggest win? Hmm. I would... Oh, man, that's a tough one. Uh, maybe audience creation. So, that's what I mean. So, like, I, I actually do like digital marketing as my day job. So, this is actually a more of a side business. So, my day job, I do analytics at a marketing agency. And one thing we're really focusing on is audience audience creation and the feedback loop of that. Meaning, like, if someone, if you have a group of people that buy stickers or buy products from you, you turn, you get that list of customer data and feed it back into Facebook or your ad platform. And so you continue to optimize, not just based on the actual conversion, but the audience that's converting well. So for, for a, a new business, what, first I would say a big win is getting some like first party, first party data, like really good customer data, and then feed that back into your ad platforms so it becomes automated. Or sorry, so it becomes more optimized. And then you got to automate that process. So eventually audience creation becomes less of a time-consuming thing, but more of like something you can co continue to optimize and you get more customers you get better conversions and then you, your, your spend becomes more efficient. Got it. So just like uh, an example would be like if you're running, running like Facebook ads or something, you're talking about making sure that you have your pixel set up on your site. Like is that the idea behind what you would do to make sure that you're building your audience in a kind of automatic way? Yeah, Facebook pixel is one. But also if you want to use first party data like emails, finding a way to like get, get that level of data and pushing it back into Facebook so it becomes even more like targeted. Got it. Because you're saying that right now people might collect their emails and then just kind of let them sit in a separate system. Let's say you have MailChimp or something set up and you're collecting emails. It's sitting in one system, but not in, not being fed back into your ad platform. What do you do to automate that piece to get it from getting, getting those emails that you're collecting back into uh, your ad platform? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So there, it's almost automated. But for example, let's so my email processor is actually Klaviyo. And I, I think they're a really strong email platform that uh, that can segment groups of people that visit your site and get uh, specific interactions. So what I do is like I automate emails. Well, the um, the collection, well not collection, like the compiling of first party data, like email addresses, and then get that sent to me over every month at the end of the month, and and then splitting by high versus mid versus low value customers, and then all I gotta do is really just pop it into Facebook. So it can start creating these audiences and then I can update my ads a little bit and, and target even further. So the, the actual like grabbing of the first party data from the email platform, that's the part that's actually automated. So I don't have to actually go in every month to do it. I just create these rules. So it sends an email to me. I grab the data, push into Facebook really quick and it does, it does the function.
And these are existing customers. Correct. These are existing customers or people that are potentially showing like high interest to purchase from the site. Got it. And has that been the automation, the optimization that you've made that has had the biggest impact on on your business or is there something else that, that, that has had a bigger impact? The biggest impact on the business, I'd say it's two things. So one is actually moving over to Shopify. So I was using a whole different e-commerce platform. The Shopify checkout function, I think, is, is one of the best around. It, it's just really simple. People can just, it, it's really just, I think it's three steps, but it's, it's super simple. And the e-commerce rate actually jumped, like the conversion rate jumped after moving over to Shopify because of the speed and the simplicity of the site. And then also the audience targeting. So because my products, I have such a wide range of products on, for example, going from like uh, Mexican food stickers to like Korean food stickers to like flags, based on what people buy, I can actually like segment audiences and say, all right, I know these people bought X, these people bought Y, put that into Facebook and then say, hey, Facebook, find me people just like them and then create ad copy around that. And so the the ads become super specific, not just in product, but in copy and audience. And so because the ads have become more like, targeted and optimized, the returns on AdSense has grown. And from there, I can spend more on ads and just continue to grow. Got it. Yeah. If you can pay more for a customer or you can you can drive down your costs, like you can scale way faster. So how do you personalize your ads? Is it done in an automated way or do you have like, some kind of template that you, you work off and you do that part manually? The, the actual ad creation part, like the ad copy, I, I do it myself. So I have temp, so I have like a spreadsheet of like, here, here's the audience I'm testing. Here's the image set and here's the ad copy I'm testing. And from there, I just, um, what well, I spent enough to I hit where I hit a point of statistical significance saying this ad is better than the other one. And I continue to just test that to see which ad set works really well against this group. Until the point where it's so good that I, I constantly try to find new, or I do another test to beat the one that's doing really well. And if I can't beat it, then I just say this is the one. I just keep it going until it, it's kind of stagnated and then try a new one. Yeah, I think that's an important point about statistical significance. I think a lot of people that are going on the strategy of using paid ads to 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 drive traffic and get sales from it, it's it's hard to understand when to give up and when to keep continue pursuing. So, I would love to hear more about your strategy. So, how many ads do you do you test with to start if you have a a new product that you want to test with a new audience? Yeah, it's um, it's a tough one. It depends on context. There's so many variables that come to play. If you have a high margin item, there, there's um, you have a bigger like, like like bigger margins to play with. So if someone buys, let's say one product, you can actually use the profits from that to target more customers. With a low margin item like mine, uh, I actually recommend not going with ads immediately with Facebook ads, but going first with like uh, influencers. So what I actually did originally was. Because I didn't know like what I know now about how to specific target with, with these with particular groups of people, with specific ad messages, I actually contacted a few influencers that I thought were in market to what my product was or close to it. So one, one work with them to start running, well, get them to do a post, drive traffic to your site. Once people purchase on your site, then you start collecting first party data, which is like the email addresses, and then pump that back into Facebook so you can start creating new audiences saying, hey, Facebook, find people just like these so I can run ads against and test. And from there, you just you can maybe do like two ad sets or, or sorry, two ads, A versus B, and just see which one works. Okay, definitely want to get back to that, that uh, kind of first step in a second about getting the first party data through influencer marketing. Before we get there, once you start with those ads, what do you start tweaking first? Like let's say it's kind of working, not really, and you want to kind of redo another round of testing. Do you change the copy? Do you change the images? Like, what's the first thing that you recommend? I, or do you change everything? Like, what's the what do you what's your approach towards making tweaks to, to determine what's uh, kind of beating the control? First thing would be probably image. If you're running Facebook ads, that's the first thing people are looking at. It's not the ad copy. So one test like completely different images because you want to see which direction are people more towards. For example, with mine, my Im the original set I tested was the stickers on just like a random background. And it was actually through, um, for example, I think it was, um, what's it called? 
it's, it's some like image software. You just put the image on top of a background. So the sticker was on some kind of background. It, it didn't look like I took a picture with my phone. It just looked like I put it, I made it on the computer. It's like a Canva or like a Snappa or something. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was Snappa. Putting the image in Snappa and then making an ad out of that versus me physically just holding a sticker and taking pictures of the sticker. And so what I found was the the image of the actual sticker, not the proof of it, but not the one like on the on the Snappa background. That one completely beat out the Snappa one, like the one I'm actually holding the sticker. So I I think. Add the, the image itself should be tested first. Do two, 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 like do two completely different sets, and then see which one wins. And then from there you start optimizing. Because if I know like the physical image works, try different versions of a physical image, so like me holding a sticker or like multiple versions of the same sticker on, on like on the floor and taking a picture of it, and then see what works from there. And do you ever then switch to copy, or like you just constantly sticking with how to tweak and try different images out? I definitely test copy, but that's once I determine like a winner of like what is a really good type of image. They just can't be beat for for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's hard to beat it. At that point, it's all right. Let's, let's optimize a little further. And for me, it was actually the ad copy that said like uh, these stickers are weatherproof and waterproof, and so providing immediately immediate value of like or well, people that, that don't know my brand or don't know my stickers, it's showing them immediately what I'm selling, and the and like what is the um, like, why buy these stickers compared to other stickers? Got it. Right. Get, get right to the point. Essentially, okay, that makes sense. So once you are, once you are, um, so let's talk about the the collecting the first party data. So you mentioned to me that hey, you don't actually want to go with Facebook ads first, which actually is the approach that a lot of people do, and you think that's a mistake. You're saying go first with influencer marketing, buy kind of basically sponsored posts, and you're recommending that. Is that because you are more likely to get sales right off the bat that way like why go, what's the significance of going with uh, influencers first rather than you know running you know the same amount of money essentially into facebook ads yeah um well ultimately it just depends on what your product is like if you're like mine like with stickers i, I couldn't find an audience in facebook that made total sense um well in the very beginning so for example, um, well, with me, I, I found a group of like influencers that I thought were in my target demographic, like my sticker product, and so paid them, and then I asked them to basically drive traffic to my site. These people came to my site and bought, and from there, you, um, well, one, you validated in Facebook Analytics, saying, all right, tell me like what kind of demographics are buying on my site, and then also grab that first party data and throw it into Facebook to create lookalike audiences of these individuals. And so Facebook is like really, really good at like creating lookalike audiences. And so that's one, well, actually this actually does multiple things. One, it helps you get first party data so you can create audiences. And also one, it's, um, i sorry, another thing is, um, it's basically validating that your product has some kind of fit in the market. Got it. Okay, so you're saying basically it's easier to target your demographic by going with an influencer that yeah you believe has your audience than to try to find like there's probably no Facebook ad targeting in, in inside of the ads manager that says that, that that targets people that like stickers right so it's probably hard to find that so instead you look for the demographic that's represented in one of these influencers so how do you target based on the influencer like what are you looking at at the uh, you're doing I'm assuming you're doing this on Instagram. Yeah. Okay. So, what are, you, what are you doing on? What are you What are you looking for on their Instagram profile? Their following? What are you looking at exactly to say this This is a person's a good fit to to uh, to pay for a sponsor post. Man, it it ultimately comes down to a hunch. So, like, what you think? So, for example, um, I'm a I'm a huge fan of that Tacova's episode. It was really good. But if I was the Tacova's owner, early on, I would have probably found some kind of like influencers that are country music based or like country outfit based. Talk to them to get a sponsored post, get them to drive traffic to the site and then purchase and use that first party data. So ultimately it comes down to like hunch. I don't think there is an exact platform that, that directly matches product to influencer. If there's one out there, definitely use that. But ultimately it comes down to, because you know your product best, find an influencer that you think would be really good as a fit. And it's not just, I guess in your case, because you are 
you have so many different products that are essentially targeting different interests. You are you were looking for a, a, a an Instagram influencer that matched specifically with a, a product, right? Not not with your entire website. You weren't looking for an influencer that that talked about stickers, right? You're looking for influencers that maybe post about like uh, I don't know, Mexican food, like you mentioned, as one of your stickers. Is that is that the idea? Yep, exactly. So my early on was more about culture and food. So since when we when we first started, we only had like three stickers. It was the Comida Callejera bundle. So it had the uh, Concha, Tacos, and Elote. So there's no like Facebook audience saying, hey, find me all Concha lovers or, or Elote lovers. So I had to like get a little more creative. And then, so I found like influencers on Instagram that talk about these foods, that eat these food and have, and have pictures with them. So it's, it's sending them the product, getting them to take a picture with it. And from there, I, you know, that's <laughs> It's one way to drive traffic, really. Got it. Okay, so now how do you begin this relationship with an influencer? For anyone that has never done this before, you are, you know, let's say you're following them now because you're interested in in working with them to start. You're sending them like a direct message or something or an email. Like what's the, get, walk us through the, the steps that you recommend someone take if they find an influencer that they think is a good fit for their product. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of these uh, influencers, like the bigger ones that have like a million following or like 500 to a million, how many thousands to a million? Just they usually have an email in their bio, and it's like a business email. Email them first because it, they probably get so many DMs that it might get lost. So email them first. If they don't email back, just try one more time. It probably like a few days later, and then DM as a last result. So our last option, and then they usually get back to you with their rates. And so ultimately, it just depends on like what what are their rates? How much are you comfortable? like spending as a first try because like you might get like just really low volume of sales that's not even worth it so it's how much you're willing to risk early on i was willing to risk risk um a decent amount because i thought it would work so we worked with an influencer that had a, a million followers and we worked with her and then she brought me basically a huge bump in traffic early on and then because i got so many sales i could actually use the uh, the profits from from that original campaign, and also the first party data to create look like audiences and start running tons of ads. And that was like the snowball effect that 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 kicked things that kicked that kicked everything off for you. Yep, yep. And also another thing is like these influencers usually have other media companies watching them. So this influencer had a few publications that I wanted to work with. They saw she um, post or she's working with and posted these. And so these media publications saw that and started writing about the product as well. I got it. So you would recommend then for people to go for these bigger influencers, like 500,000 and above versus like, uh, you know, another strategy is look for a kind of micro influencers with like 50,000 or less. It, it really depends. Depends how, like how engaged are they with, are they with their audience? Is it a good fit with you? And how much, will, like how much does it cost? There's an influencer that I wanted to work with. And her price was just ridiculously high. Um, so early on, I wasn't willing to spend that much. So if you're just starting, I'd probably recommend work, working with someone with like under 50000 just to validate your product to see if, if you can generate sales. I got it. So at first, are you looking to always make a profit with, with this strategy or are you just looking to kind of pay for that first party data? Man, that's a good question. I'd say both. I'd say... Well, validate product market fit to see if you can get sales. Also, get some kind of revenue back so you can push, you can use to get you, well, generate revenue so you can use that profit to make new products or run more ads. And then also getting the first party data so you can start running or creating audiences to do lookalikes. So it, it does multiple things. Got it. But you, you typically would recommend someone to try to get make a profit on this and not just to 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 do this to get that to follow that strategy of getting that first party data like yes you want to validate it you know get some sales but not just validate it with sales but actually make your money back on the investment you put in for the sponsored post yep exactly got it makes sense okay that's cool so now you got the uh first party data in so now you have actual buyers and lookalike audiences in facebook and you can you can start driving uh, ads towards them so that kind of kicked everything everything off for you i want to actually jump back to this this question of uh, automation so as you're automating this it sounds very automated so far i mean there's the outreach part but then once you start getting data in you're really feeling the the kind of system of of your ads and making sure that you you're optimizing it uh, I want to talk about what is something that you actually 
can't, it would never automate. Is there something like that that you would never automate that you feel like just you can't cannot be done through automation? Yeah, it's really the comments of these of the ads that I'm running. So a lot of like since I'm running so many ads, I get a lot of comments in the actual ad themselves, and I read through every single one because they'll even like throw some insights in or like they'll even ask a question. That I never thought a question would ask, and that could actually immediately be answered in the ad copy itself. So, for example, early on, when I was running the ad, a lot of people would ask, "Are these stickers waterproof?" And and that I could not automate reading the comments. So I read the comments, and since I got so many of those questions, I put that saying these stickers are waterproof basically in the ad copy, and I stopped getting that question, and basically the ads actually performed better as well. That makes sense. I think that's important. One, I, we actually did a podcast recently that I don't believe is out yet about running ads, and a lot of people will run ads and just move on. Like they run run ads and never look at their posts. And he's and the the, the guy that I interviewed was basically saying like you spend so much money on these ads, like there's so much valuable insight in there, like the way you mentioned. But then also you can engage with your customer on there. These people have spent the time to actually post a comment, like they are going to be your most kind of invested customers. So don't run ads and just kind of ignore them. That's only a part of it. The the bigger part is look at the comments, like you're saying. So you you, sh- you strike me as a kind of a very uh, methodical and quantitative person. Is there any kind of quantitative like analysis? analysis that you're doing on these comments or are you just kind of reading them and internalizing them and then over time you start recognizing just in your head some kind of pattern that appears that you can then use to change your messaging or maybe eventually change a product even yeah um appreciate the nice comment man (laughs) um but uh like these uh these ads so when i read these comments i don't like jot them down somewhere saying hey this is the amount of times i got this comment it's just more like a, a gut feel at that point I'm getting this so many times that I'm recognizing that this is something that people want answered. So I change the ad copy. Then I also even go to my site to see like, am I missing this on the site? Early on, it didn't even say like the stickers are waterproof. And then later on, when I started getting all those comments, I went to the site and saw that there's nothing on the site explaining that as well. So making that change to the site actually led to a slight increase in conversion rate as well. That's awesome. Okay, so that makes sense. I think that a lot of people would think, oh man, there's such a big undertaking to read these comments, but it, you, I think if you just uh, kind of uh, surround yourself with these comments, you will be compelled to take action on them because they, they become so... If everyone's asking you, is it water, waterproof, waterproof over and over again, it's kind of hard to ignore <laughs> that that kind of question. So that, that makes sense. You don't actually have to do anything special with the comments. Just Just read them and then you'll get guidance out of it. That makes sense. Okay. So you mentioned that the way that you decide what to automate is by tracking what you spend your time on, tracking uh, the processes that, or tracking things that you're doing and then seeing what can be turned into actually actual automation or through some kind of process. So talk to us about this. Like, how do you track this? Like, how do you, like, how minute do you get with your tracking of the activities that you spend your on your business? Um, so there's a tool out there called Harvest and Harvest is actually for, I think it's, it's for contractors or freelancers. So you can see how much time is spending on certain clients with certain tasks. So I consider, well, for Harvest, the way I set up, I consider my business, my client. So for each task that I spend the most time on, there's a button you just click to see how much time you're basically spending on it. And so I've been tracking what I'm doing for the, for the past few months. And then I see like, all right, here's what I'm spending way too much time on that's not really driving much like, growth or revenue. And then here's like, when then basically how much would it cost to outsource this so I don't spend time on it and then focus that time so I can do things that actually help grow the business. So it gets down to that level for me. What is something that you would prefer to spend your time on then that, that would grow the business? Like what is the most high value thing that you're doing these days to grow the business? Man, it's, uh, it's, it's probably few things going on. So I'd say testing, like creating all these like micro audiences on Facebook because my site is like so big. And I mean, sorry, I have so many like views now, like I have a whole, like tons of variations of products that start creating all these audiences out separately. And it's just basically creating different ad sets, tweaking them, tip tweaking messaging across like tons of ad sets. I think that would make a huge difference. Well, actually it does make a difference in, in growth. So, for example, I'm testing now people that are interested in particular sports. So I have a, I have a, a set of stickers that are like fitness-based. 
So like a protein shaker, squat rack, a flat bench. So using those images, just holding them up, taking a picture of it, and then running those ads across people that are they have that are like fitness enthusiasts. So that would be an ad set. Another one would be like people that are are bowling fans. And I have a bowling pin sticker, take a picture of that, and then um, run an ad ad against people that are bowling fans. So it's like creating tons of ads and tons of variations against tons of audiences. That actually, it takes a lot of time, but I, I think it leads, it, it, it's probably the most effective way for, for me to spend my time. I got it. But I, be, I bet your ads manager must be like cryptic. I, I'm like imagining like a scene in a beautiful mine where there's like numbers like floating everywhere and just like all over the place. Like how do you keep <laughs> it all organized? I'm sure you have like a thousand things on there. How do you understand what you've put into there? Because it sounds like there's so many slices of your audience that you try to break down and, and so many different ads you're testing beyond that. Yeah, so I hold everything at the ad set level, especially for the audiences. At the at the campaign level, I just do more about what type of convert or what I'm optimizing towards and it's conversion. At the ad set levels where I'm working on the audiences. So within the conversion based campaign, there's like hundreds of um audiences that I'm working with. So baseball enthusiasts, like bowling fans, like fitness enthusiasts. Um yeah, just tons of <laughs> like audiences within the ad set. And they're all split out separately. I got you. Okay. And so lastly, one, one question, last question about the idea of focusing on your process. You mentioned that the processes take motivation out of the equation because there are just some days that you are not motivated at all to work on your business. What does it mean to you? Like, what do you mean when you say that the processes take motivation out of the question or out of the equation? Man, that's a great question. All right. So there's this book I read called the war of art. And anyone listening, I highly recommend it. There's this one section that talks about the professional. And it's basically the professional just gets up and does the work no matter what. And that's the way I, pre- I proceed it. I, I just go with it. So there's processes, there's days I don't want to do specific things, but I just consider myself like that book, like the professional just gets up and does it. So I agree, it's not really about motivation at that point. It's just, this is what I need to do to serve my customers as well and to grow my business. Hey. Real quick, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know what you think or what you'd like to hear more of. Now, let's get back to the interview. I got it. Okay, makes sense. All right, so let's talk about the the approach towards releasing new products. Do you actively try to – because you, you have so many SKUs, so many categories. How do you – and you also mentioned that you also have a day job, which I want to touch a bit in a second too, is how do you make sure that you are not overwhelming yourself with all these new product releases and then, of course, having to test them and uh, testing ads and validating them? Like, How do you make sure that you are growing slow enough so that you're not driving yourself crazy? <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. Um, it's all about processes at that point. There are – like so, when I get home, I I have a five hour window of exactly what I can work when I can work my business, and I split that time exactly how to do things that that will move the business forward. So, I'll spend X amount of time on audience like Facebook ads, and then just seeing what's going on, tweaking little things. Then I spend the next few hours on let's say packing stickers. Next few hours, you're planning emails. So there's like I I basically schedule everything in my day when I come home, and this is when I cook. This is when I work out. This is when I do stuff for the business and I have that all basically planned out for the week and the weekend as well. Ultimately, it's just because I'm limited in time because I do have a day job. I have to get like my mood to like what I'm spending my time on. That makes sense. Yeah, I just recently read this this post about that this concept of having sacred time where you cannot do anything other than the 100% of the tasks that actually drive revenue for you. And it sounds like you've carved that out and you show up. Like you're saying, you're you're the professional in your business. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of people are professionals in their day jobs and are willing to show up even if they're not – uh, you know, exactly motivated, but you can apply the same line of thinking towards showing up for your business. And I'll talk about this. So you, 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 again, we mentioned early on about how it's a multiple six figure business. I know many people that come on this show, many people that I've spoken to that quit their day job way before this point, you still have yours. What makes you, what will make you go full time into this business? It just comes down to the point where if I can no longer sustain my job and the business, then I would have to really consider the option. But for now, it's it's to the point where I can still manage both. 
I, I really enjoy both. My day job is actually really interesting. I work with a, a team of people that are super smart and they motivate me as well. And so they got me thinking about audiences in a different way as well. So, you know, we're, we're talking about like prospecting audiences, people that have never been to your site and how you can basically find them. So the, the clients I work with at my job and the team I work with, we, we think about audiences, like the internal audiences on your site. So people that went to your site did specific actions but didn't convert, you can create audience pools based on them. So it's basically tagging your site super specifically. So when people come to your site, you know exactly what they did and you can remarket to people that did specific actions but not, did not convert. So I'm just really motivated by both things, my my job and my business, and they work well with each other. So. Yeah, I'm sure you learn a ton of things at the job that you can apply in your business and vice versa. And I feel like this is a very interesting dynamic that you must have at work. And I think it's also a goal that a lot of people want to get to where they are almost like kind of untouchable because they have multiple revenue sources, not, you know, their day job, of course, but then you kind of don't need your day job, right? But you're, not, you're safe if something, if something at work ever happened. What is that like? Cause I think a lot of people have this as a goal in mind where they want to get to a point where they can kind of pick and choose what they do at work because they're not kind of, I guess, held at the mercy of requiring a paycheck. So I would love to hear your perspective on what that's been like since you do have a multiple six, six figure business and, and of course your day job. Yeah. It's an interesting dynamic. Cause like, yeah, in a, a one way to explain it, it's untouchable, but I don't, I see it a little different. It's more like I have the freedom to do really whatever I want. And because I have the freedom, I just, I intentionally chose, to be here and to stay here, actually. I really like my team and I, just, I learn from them constantly. And so, and they bring me a ton of value and I bring them a ton of, a ton of value as well. So that, that relationship is really interesting. Um, and the, the really good thing is um, it gives me freedom to kind of fail, fail at work. I've always felt like I had that freedom, but like, especially when you have, well, another job on a tie, basically, I can get a little riskier with like what I'm willing to do, like t- take things a little further with clients and like take them to the next level it's like higher risk but these risks will pay out further for them as well so it's, i guess it's being less afraid to do things that are riskier yeah that makes sense. <laughs> I'm, I'm i think, totally I think sure explain it. no you that makes total sense i think you are going to be a better employee you will perform better because you are like you're saying willing to take these bigger risks which will typically yield bigger rewards and then on top of that you are probably making choices at work that are more aligned with what you truly want to do and then obviously that makes you a happier employee in and actually working on things that you care about i think that's just again a goal a lot of people would get to um but it's interesting to hear you talk about how you want to balance both for as long as possible and a, a big part of that for you is because you are getting inherent value from but then also it's just it's such a a job that's so aligned with your business where you're learning things in that field that you can apply towards your business and get and again vice versa so that's cool okay so let's talk about um the releasing of new products because you have a lot right now and it sounds like you're always constantly releasing products so what is your process for determining what category or what products to to focus on on next yeah that, that was a tough one early on but it, it's getting a, a little easier now so first, uh, we wanted to like find a, a group of products that just sell and drive revenue so that we can basically make more stickers. Now we're to the point where we have a little bit of everything. And now I'm, I'm basically, I look at my analytics and, seeing, and see like what categories are selling really well. And the ones that, that are doing really well, what have I not made yet for them? So early on, it was the uh, Comida Gallera stickers, like the Latino foods. Once I knew that was working, I completely just like built made stickers for every single category I could think of. And once that worked, I was willing to test other uh, other images. I think the next set was nature, like the flowers or the rose and the sunflower. I I started getting a lot of messages saying, hey, can I can you make a rose and sunflower? Well, you know, because I'm getting those messages, I was willing to make this product. I made the product and started selling. And then I was up, and then I completely made almost every potential like flower I could think of. And then I started getting messages saying, hey, can you make like, I think it was um, like a taco truck. Hey, can you make taco truck stickers? And then that created a whole new category. And then it was like, can you make like coffee? It made a whole new category. So when people start messaging us and leaving like like sticker ideas, like submissions, that's when we're willing to like look at what we currently have. And if we don't have it, we're willing to test it if we see a lot of the same messages. And that can open up a whole new category for us. 
the one actually we're working on now is basically a lot more animals, animals and dinosaur sets. So what, someone asked us like, hey, can you make a, a T-Rex sticker? Basically one person asked and I was going to test it. I made the sticker and that became one of our big, big hits. And from there, I just basically made all the like really popular dinosaurs, like the Brontosaurus and, and um, yeah, I don't know what that one's called, but yeah, it took just other dinosaurs. Yeah, I want to. I want to clarify this because you're so you're saying that once you uh, the, the way that you release new products, you, you look at the categories that are performing well, and you ask yourself, what am I not? What how else can I serve them? What else can I can I give them that they, that they're asking for or that they may want? So when you say category, do you typic do you want that category to have just one audience, or do you expect that kind of category to span multiple audiences? I think the part that uh, that was confused, confused me. Was, let's say that someone asked for a food truck. A food truck could be in multiple cuisines, and I'm assuming that could mean multiple audiences. So, how do you look at what do you what do you define as a category? Yeah. So, if you go to like the site, uh, every every sticker falls into some kind of category. So, a rose falls into the nature category. Tacos fall into the comida callejera. A flag falls into the flags category. So, that's that's why I think of like a lot of categories. Okay, but you you typically like looking to um, build more products for just like uh, a, an existing like a, t- a one type of audience, or are you looking to build a product that can expand to multiple audiences? That's no, it's a tough one. It's um one we have like a decent follower on Instagram, so I'll make the product. I post it on Instagram, and then hopefully the current fans like the sticker, and if they buy, then I know this is a good product. And then I'll start running ads against it. So the thing is, like, since I have all these other stickers that are selling well, they if, if I make a new product that kind of flops, I'm okay with the loss because I'm willing to, like, risk making new images, constantly make new images to find ones that are going to be, like, home runs. Got it. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, so so touching on this a little bit more, you mentioned to us that the riches are in the niches and it's much better to go deep into a category, which is what you're explaining now, than to go broad. And you mentioned this applies to the focus of the product, like in your case, you're focusing on stickers, but someone could easily focus on t-shirts or pins and also the content of the product itself. So again, the content of the product itself, I think the example is just different types of stick or different uh uh, designs basically of stickers. So it talks about this more like what, when you are thinking about picking a, a niche, I think a lot of people are worried about picking the wrong one. How do you, I guess, what, what, what is the, what is your response to that? If someone is just really hesitant about moving forward because they're worried about investing their time or resources into the quote unquote, the wrong niche. And by niche, you mean a product like pins versus t-shirts. Um, yeah, sure. I think that that's that's definitely uh, something that I see a lot. Where you go to a site and they have lots of different types of products. So how do you decide which ones to go with first? Oh man, and this is, if I'm recommending someone, I would say don't go, don't make a product purely because another company is doing it really well. It's going to be incredibly hard. You have to have like tons of passion into it. So make a product that really, you, you know what, there's definitely an audience or you're just really excited about it. And then really it's just uh, like constant testing and iteration to find like, as long as you have like one or two products that are absolute home runs that you know, you know are going to sell constantly, from there you, you, you should be willing to test new products. Like take, the, take the profits from the ones that are home runs and try to find new home runs. And how how deep do you go before you decide? Okay, well, I hit hit the bottom or hit the bottom that I'm willing to go, and I'm going to start branching to the right or the left. Uh, for me, I I I didn't care too much about making a profit early on. It's just I just wanted to constantly grow. So as soon as I made my money back on making a new image, I I told my my designers, hey, I knew, I want a new one. So there was really no the bottom was like as soon as I made enough profit to make a new image. It was basically that. Okay, got it. Okay, let's talk about that that, that actual design process. So you, you're you not designing it yourself. You have a team of designers that are, built, are creating these stickers for you? Yeah, I have a few designers. Uh, they kind of like specialize in a few different things. So one is, one person focuses on like, let's say food, one is on the characters, one is on cityscapes. So they all have like their own specialties. Got it. Uh, how did you find your designers? There's a website called Dribble. 
so D R I B D B L E dot com. And there's it's there's a ton of great designers on there. So all you gotta do is just message them and then negotiate a rate. Well, what's your what's your role in working with them? Like, if someone uh, do you have like a background in design, or do you are you do you have like an eye for design? Like how important is that if you want to go down this route, but maybe you don't have any kind of formal training on design, but you're looking to hire someone? Can you still get by by just hiring someone, or do you need to have some kind of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, guidance for them? So I have no formal training in like design or artwork. I'm just a big fan of it. I've always been a fan of like pop art and like Roy Lichtenstein kind of pop art. And so I wanted to make stickers in that style. So I looked at Dribble, try to like search for like keywords for like pop art or stuff like that. And I found a few designers that had a similar feel to what I thought would work. And I reached out to them and then we worked out a deal. But if you want, like it just depends. There's so many designers out there. And Dribble just has so many good ones. At, at that point, it's just find the one that you think would represent or draw your product the best way that represents how you want your business to be. So, for example, my taco plate. Um, the designer I work with, uh, she she made it really well. Uh, I just, I saw her work, like her work, her profile on her site had a ton of images. It didn't have a taco plate though, but I thought that her style of images could work well for the taco that I, I was thinking about. So again, it's just more about gut feel. Got it. So when you're going on Dribble and you're messaging them, what is the talk to us about? Because I, mean, I think if most people here are familiar with like other more generalized platforms like Upwork or some freelancer or something like that, but Dribble specifically for designers, what is the the typical, I guess, process for, let's say you identify a couple people, you're messaging them, like what are you setting them initially and how does it all how does work begin essentially? Yeah, so super early on when I first started, I messed with a few and there was like a few really popular designers. They had a ton of followers on the site, tons of likes. I reached out to them. I was, you know, asking them how much is the rate? Uh, are you willing to work you know, work with me even though I don't have a site yet? Basically all of them said no. <laughs> so I had to find a few that are like under like under follow underappreciated like they don't have a ton of followers but their work is extremely good so just reaching out to them and you know saying hey i really love your images uh i'm starting a business you know what are your rates for basically a new design and also to protect yourself as the business owner get a, get a lawyer and get out a copyright agreement so that when you do purchase these images that you are the full owner of the images Usually these designers are cool with signing uh, some kind of agreement like that? Yeah, most of them are. If they're not willing to sign it, I would, me personally, I would move away because that might cause some problems. Because legally in the future, um, of, at, at that point, it's actually their images. You're just kind of using it. So I don't want any like miscommunication there. So I want to be able to own the actual images and just basically trade like, here is X amount for the images, but I want to own the images outright in the future. And do you look for a designer that's created art in the in the um, I guess category that you are looking to hire them for, or is it more important to look for the the design style or aesthetic? I guess that that you're going for aesthetic. There's a lot of designers that are like T-shirt based, but I think they can be like stickers or pins. So I, I go with like in terms of ranking, it'd be aesthetic first, good, and then like look at the colorway. Like um, some of them are just they use colors that are not super vibrant and don't fit well with me. And then they don't add like I don't know like, I don't know the exact terminology, but like texture where it looks like they're like shadow in the images, things like that. So uh, one, make sure the images are just really good. From there, you can you can actually just get them to design in a way that fits your medium. So it could be stickers or pins or t-shirts. Okay, got it. And what direction do you do you give them once you hire someone? Like how much input do you do you give? So I usually just give them like, well, I guess it depends by designer, but I feel like food. I can just Google something and find a really good image and say, hey, give me something close to this. I don't want the exact one. And also give them like some like additional references. Like here, here's, here's how we eat it. Here's some YouTube videos. Uh, here's what I think should be on the image. Because like the tacos, I couldn't find a perfect image of tacos. So I provided a few examples saying, hey, I want 
like tacos that look like this, but on a paper plate that looks like this, and in soft cups that look like this. So it's just giving them as much direction as you can. Got it. Now let's talk about the design of the of your store, of your site itself. Is that done by you or did you hire for, for that one too? Uh, that was on me. So I basically found a theme and then put it on a Shopify site and then tailoring that more towards like my style, like the colors, the logos, the, the wording, all that. Cool. Do you remember the theme that you chose for your site? I think it's Empire. And what, what about like applications that you use? Are, are there any apps that you use that you recommend others check out? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a few that I think are really good. So I heard from your podcast that some, someone else recommended it. It's called Judge Me. That's probably my favorite to reviews one. So use that for reviews and you can basically request reviews as well. Loyalty Lion, if you're willing to, base, willing to make like a, a loyal customer base. So once they buy products or do certain actions, you give them more points and kind of like incentivize them to buy more and kind of gamify that process. Another one is uh, Orderify. So Orderify allows users to basically edit their order after, make, after they make a purchase. So they don't have to contact you to make any changes. And then lastly, it's it's not a, an actual app, but it's a platform. So Clavio, the email-based platform. So that one basically, once you use the plugin on your site, it starts tagging your site so you can start creating very specific audiences and remarket emails to them. Okay, so thank you so much, Remy. So blanktag.co is the website. And I'll leave you with this last question. Like, What needs to happen this year for you to consider the year a success? <laughs> Man, it's a tough one. Uh, so the uh, benchmarks we set for ourselves are is um, 750 SKUs on the site. So just tons of stickers. And... We really just judge our, our our success metrics. Really, just like how many happy customers are there, and we kind of judge that based on their views. So, as long as we get up above four point nine five on our site over the year and and start and stars, then I'm happy. Yeah, so far as of today, there's almost five hundred reviews. Looks like it's like averages to five. Star- I can't even see the downside detail, but it looks like it's averages down to like almost five stars, at least five stars. Um, so yeah, so really appreciate again you coming on, Remy. Again, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. To get your exclusive 30-day extended trial, visit shopify.com slash masters.